For more than 20 years, Oprah's book club was this kind of social and literary phenomenon. Basically transformed American publishing entirely. And then it stopped for almost a year. And now it's back. The new debut book Oprah Winfrey has picked for the relaunch of this phenomenon is the novel The Water Dancer by ta Coates. It's about a slave man named Hiram who, through his ability to bend time and space, tries to find his way to freedom. Joining me now is National Book Award winner, Pulitzer Prize finalist, recipient of the Mark Arthur Genius Grant, author of The Water Dancer, Tana Coates. Thanks for having How me. How are you, man? I'm good. I'm all right. How are you feeling? I'm okay. I'm all right. Week two, week seven, like I was telling you. So. Um, this book, I, you and I have talked about this book for years because it's been in process for mm-hmm. years. What was the origin of it, and when did you know you wanted to write fiction, you want to write a novel, as opposed to an essay or memoir, or things like that? So I think I like I have fantasies. Like, I always love, like, Juno Diaz's Drown. I always love Colson White has Intuitionist and, you know, like, E.L. Doctor. All that. I had fantasies, but I didn't think it was quite possible. <laughs> you know, fiction, it looks like magic. It really does. It really, to it me, really it's does. like someone being like, yeah, I just ran 50 miles. Yeah. And I'm like, that doesn't, like, a human can do that? It's like, yeah, 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 you, you train, you because can do you it. Because you believe it. Like, you actually get into and But what I quickly realized was, like, all writing, it's not. You know, it's work. You know, it's a lot of work. And so after I finished my first book, my editor was like, and my agent, they were both like, we think you should try this. And it took 10 years. <laughs> was there, was there, is there a mental switchover that happens in your head from writing an essay or a work of nonfiction to, to being in the world of the book and writing in the world of the book? Yes. Um, the fiction feels more closed off than nonfiction. You, From the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like when you're writing in nonfiction, like I am operating in the world of Chris Hayes and everybody. It's a mutual sort of thing you're, you know what I mean, you're working in. Whereas in fiction, it's actually just your world. You know, even though it's slave, it's actually your slavery. You understand what I'm saying? You've painted, you know, certain things, there's certain vocabulary, there's certain ways of being, but you know, among the characters. So it's a much, much closed off space, I would say. How much? Um, it's like going in a room and shutting the door, right. which is sort of cool, actually. Right. I mean, I imagine that's there's something liberating about that. Yeah, yeah, that. extremely, extremely. The book is um, the book's incredible, and I got to read it a, a, a few months ago. And actually, I've, I read it, and then I've been reading the David Blight Pulitzer Prize winning biography of oh, Fred, man, Frederick Douglass, which is fantastic. And when I was reading the Blight book, I was thinking mm-hmm. about your book and mm-hmm. about the research that went into it, because mm-hmm. the book is about uh, slavery and a slave and, and his sort of life world and his journey to freedom. Mm-hmm. How much were you, how much research was there? How much were you trying to sort of like mm-hmm. figure out how to conjure that world? It was a ton. I mean, I read, you know, a, ton, a bunch of primary documents, letters, narratives, you know, books written by enslaved people or freed people. Uh, went to a bunch of plantations, went to Monticello, went to huh. Mon- Montpelier, uh, went to um, the Whitney Plantation down down in New Orleans, uh, which is outside of New Orleans. Um, yeah, quite a bit. Did that? Did that? The, the physical bearing of being in those locations, because there's the, 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 the there's these long descriptions of what the plantations like. Right. Um, did that transform the way that you thought about yes, the world? Yes. Yes. And the descriptions of that are almost entirely inspired by Monticello and Montpelier. Um, there's a lot of Jefferson, and it's like a Jefferson cross with Frederick Douglass sort of thing. There is a yeah. Um, but yeah, it was it was a lot. It was it was a lot. I mean, I, I don't. Without the historians and archaeologists, you know, both of those two sites, it's no way I could have wrote that book. You know, there's one theme in the book that I had not thought of a lot, I think, which is the paradox for the slave, which is that um, the diminished economic prospects of the master Mm -hmm. spell uncertainty and Mm -hmm. possibly a worse fate, which Mm -hmm. is to be sold down river, essentially, Mm -hmm. to go into Mm -hmm. the deep south Mm -hmm. from, say, somewhere like Maryland to Mm -hmm. somewhere like Mississippi. And that in a weird way, you're you're so bound to this master that them encountering economic ruin can be a terrible thing for you because it means things are going to get worse for your life. Right, and Jefferson is the the stereotypical case of this. I mean, here you have a guy, you know, for all of his brilliance, um, was a bad business Basket man. case. Yeah, just yeah. a complete, complete, total bad. I mean, it's like drinking really expensive wines and living high on a hill. And when he dies, he is deeply, deeply in debt. And the thing that he has that is most value is, is the bodies of people. And so they literally sell those people out on the lawn outside of the big house at, at Monticello and break up those families to pay off his debt. Um, for so, for yeah, one too many bottles of wine. For one too many bottles of wine, exactly, exactly. I mean, Monticello, in, 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 in many ways, in and of itself, is uh, 
just a, like where they built it, it's like bad farming land. There's no you know water to get to. It was just a terrible, terrible idea. But he had this vision of being up on a hill, which in itself is this kind of metaphor, you know? Well, there's this another thing in the book that really stuck with me was just the, the fact that the way a plantation operates in a slave society is that the slaves actually, it's not just that they have all the labor, they actually have all the knowledge. That's right. The place in, entirely depends right. about not just the slave's backs and muscles, no, but they yeah. actually understand when That's things right. have to be planted, what That's has right. to happen. Every process in the That's entire right. place right. is the slave's mental acuity right. driving the whole right. thing. Well, I think Jefferson often wasn't there. Right. For the absentee percent, landlords, completely, com, you know, Completely absent. And um, you know, one of the things I think about is these huge marble columns, beautiful marble columns, not marble. I don't know what they're made out of, okay. but like these huge columns outside of uh, 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 Monticello. They literally, and, and, and this enslaved man named Jupiter cut the columns and had them put that. They don't know how he did it. Like even now, like they, they, they have no idea how he did it. And so one of the things I was trying to get off, get across in the book is enslavement is not just enslavement of the body. It's not this just, you know, run over there and pick cotton. You know what I mean? It's actually enslavement of, of, of the mind also in, in so many skills. Jefferson had uh, Sally Hemings' brother taken over the Paris, trained as a French cook. I mean, that's like a heavily, you know what I mean? Right. Like you can't just, you know, that's not just brute labor. You know, to you know, make sure that he could, you know, have all of these, you know, fine delicacies that that he enjoyed. There, there's a quote um, from the, the the warmth of other suns by Isabel mm -hmm. Wilkerson about the sort of northern migration, where you mm -hmm. say what binds these stories together was the back against the wall, reluctant yet hopeful search for something better, any place where they than where they were where they were. They did what human beings looking for freedom throughout history have often done. They left. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that quote, mm -hmm. um, and I thought about your book, which is about that, and also about the moment that we're in when we see people doing everything they can at the greatest peril right. to show up at the border with their nine-year-old, right. maybe even drowning in the river. Right, and, and the other part, I mean, just, to, you know, linking it to the news today, and I really did not realize this until about January or February or so, um, family separation and destruction of families is a huge theme in the book. Um, and I was thinking, wow, it's really coincidental that this is happening in policy right now. But in fact, I think this is what you do to people who you despise, period. You make war upon their families. This is, you know, typical in American history that, you know, this didn't end with enslavement, you know, for black folks. Uh, and so I don't think it's a mistake that Trump in all of his uh, despising, you know, of immigrants at the border, you know, is taking it out on their children. I see. I don't think that's coincidental. Uh, the book is called The Water Dancer. It's beautiful. It is a great read uh, by Ta-Nehisi Coates, debut novel. Thank you. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.